A normal weekday morning, and Mike Shaw begins a routine that's crucial to his daily activities. First, a blood test. Mike is one of half a million people in this country with diabetes. He has difficulty in regulating the level of glucose in his blood. Today's reading is 4.2 millimoles per litre, which is within the normal range. The reason for this is that he takes regular injections of the hormone insulin. It's a fast-acting variety whose peak effect will be about two hours after the injection and which will last about six hours. Insulin is an absolute necessity for people with Mike's form of diabetes, which is known as insulin-dependent or type 1 diabetes. Less than 70 years ago, type 1 diabetes would have been fatal. Those who contracted the disease lost a considerable amount of weight and died in a coma. It was the work of two Canadian scientists, Frederick Banting and Charles Best, that reverse this tragic trend. Their studies on dogs with experimentally induced diabetes led to the isolation of insulin in 1921. When the first human patients were treated with the hormone, the results were equally dramatic. People beaming on the M1, we were telling you earlier about the southbound carriageway closed due to an accident. Today, thanks to a carefully controlled regime of insulin, Mike leads a normal life. But he can still recall the symptoms of his own insulin shortage. I first discovered that I was diabetic about four years ago. It was just after Christmas and I'd felt extremely thirsty and very lethargic all of the time, quite tired. The weeks before that, I'd been um, getting up all night to urinate because of the large amount of um, liquids that I was drinking to compensate for this thirst that I'd been having. And it was sort of catch-22 situation. And the doctor sat me down and said, I've got some bad news for you. And he said, you're diabetic. Um, I really didn't know what, what this was. And then he said, you're going into hospital straight away. So um, I, I phoned my father and he bought some um, clothes for me and took me down to the hospital. And they wheeled me onto the wall, ward, um, sat me down in a drew the curtains round the bed and the nurse brought a syringe to me and said, inject yourself. I was quite taken aback at this. I hadn't expected that at all. Um, I, I didn't know where to inject myself and um, the first injection was uh, a bit painful, but um, it, straight away after that I began to feel a lot better. We normally produce enough of our own insulin from the pancreas. This gland lies just below the liver, partially hidden by the stomach. Most of the pancreatic tissue is composed of cells that secrete digestive enzymes into the gut. But scattered throughout the gland are clusters of specialised cells, the islets of Langerhans. Within each islet, there are actually several cell types, each producing a particular hormone involved in glucose metabolism. These can be distinguished by specific staining. The red cells at the periphery are called A cells. These secrete the hormone glucagon, which counteracts insulin in blood sugar regulation. The pink cells, which are the major components of the islets, are the B cells. These are responsible for secreting insulin. Densely packed throughout the cells are storage vesicles containing insulin granules. These release the hormone only in response to the appropriate stimulus, for example, glucose in the blood. If we compare the levels of blood glucose in the body with those of insulin over a 24-hour period, we find that when there's a peak of blood sugar, for instance, after a meal, there's a corresponding surge of insulin. 
The insulin is vital in keeping the blood glucose levels within very narrow limits between 4 and 8 millimoles per litre. If there's too little insulin or the body doesn't respond normally to it, there can be a build-up of blood sugar above 10 millimoles per litre. The symptoms of this hyperglycemia are outlined by Dr John Day of the Ipswich Diabetes Centre. For well, someone uh, like Mike with type 1 diabetes, he will be suffering from severe insulin deficiency. So the first thing that will happen will be his sugar will, will start rising. And so he'll de develop the basic symptoms, which are thirst, passing too much urine, and weight loss. As the weight loss persists, he'll feel tired and develop loss of energy. He'll develop muscle wasting and weakness. And eventually, uh, if this is left uncontrolled for too long, he'll start breaking down fat, fat in the body to, to excess and produce a very dangerous condition of ketosis, that's for breakdown of fat, producing ketone bodies, which, which produce a very uh, major change in the acidity of the blood and may lead to coma and even death. On the other hand, if the level of blood glucose falls below 2.5 millimoles per litre, the result is an abnormally low blood sugar, or hypoglycemia. If you're taking insulin by injection, you may sometimes get an imbalance due to too much insulin. Then the blood sugar will fall too low, and this will produce a whole set of symptoms which are quite different. These are sudden in onset and are things such as excessive sweating, uh, hunger, palpitations, agitation. And if uh, unchecked, may lead to severe faintness and even unconsciousness. And this all may come on quite suddenly and quickly. In order to prevent any of the symptoms of high or low blood sugar, Mike must remember to take regular injections of insulin to mimic the normal effects of the hormone. He must accommodate this within his normal working schedule, which is split between office work, computing, and testing of equipment in the laboratory. His mid-morning injection is administered with a special pen injector. The Novo pen's excellent. It's a much better way of giving injections than the usual way and uh, it takes a little cartridge of fast-acting insulin and there's a needle on the end there and you just press the button to give out a, a measured dose of the fast-acting insulin. It's very useful and very handy and enables me to give injections wherever and whenever I please. So the purpose of Mike's insulin injections is to mimic the small rises and falls in his blood sugar produced by normal insulin secretion. But the type and timing of the injections are important. He injects a fast-acting insulin about half an hour before each mealtime. This allows the insulin peak to coincide with the peak of blood glucose production, restoring the blood sugar to normal. At bedtime, he injects a slow-acting insulin, which lasts about 12 hours and provides a background level that holds his blood sugar steady during the night. But how does insulin lower the blood glucose levels of the body? It acts on three main target tissues, the liver, the fat cells and the muscles. In the liver, it promotes the uptake of glucose and its storage as a reserve compound, glycogen. At the same time, it inhibits the production of glucose from other sources, such as amino acids. In muscle cells, insulin stimulates glucose uptake and its use as a metabolic fuel to provide energy. Again, any excess can be stored as glycogen. In fat cells, insulin enhances the entry of glucose and its eventual storage as fat. So by promoting the uptake of glucose and its conversion into storage compounds, insulin lowers the level of glucose in the blood. But not all people with diabetes are dependent on insulin injections. Jackie Willis has what's known as type 2, or non-insulin dependent diabetes. Her warning symptoms developed only about a year ago, a characteristic of this maturity onset form of the disease. I went to the doctors about an ankle which I twisted 
And I mentioned to him that I had had these thirsts for several months. So he did a urine test, found there was some sugar in the urine, and asked me to do a blood test. He said, I'm afraid there's quite a high blood sugar reading on your test. It's 17. This didn't mean anything to me until he said the normal person has a reading of between four and nine. I thought, that means I've got to inject myself with insulin every day. But, of course, this turned out not to be the case. But I did panic a little bit and wondered why. And then I thought, well, it was usually fat people that got diabetes. And I thought, well, that was my own fault because I'd been eating <laughs> too much of the wrong sorts of food. Diet is a particularly important consideration for people with type 2 diabetes. They may be producing reasonable quantities of insulin, but are less responsive to it, through being overweight, for instance. Instead of a special and separate diet, they're advised to eat foods that are recommended for normal, healthy eating, with as much as half the total energy coming from carbohydrates. But the type of carbohydrate is crucial. Foods that contain more fiber, such as some fruits and vegetables, are recommended because they're broken down more slowly into glucose. This leads to a more controlled release of sugar into the bloodstream. Cutting down fats is important because it reduces the risk of heart disease, which could be a complicating factor. My shopping basket changed quite a bit after I was diagnosed. And I buy everything that is marked sugar-free, and there are quite a lot of products now that are marked sugar-free. Well, of course, I mustn't eat anything sweet, which cuts out my favourite chocolate. Um, biscuits, uh, cakes, pastries. I found that a bit hard, but um, there's quite good substitutes. <laughs> But there are times when a supply of rapidly absorbed sugar is vital. In a strenuous squash match, insulin will stimulate the muscles to burn up carbohydrates. Exercise speeds up the absorption of insulin and makes the body more sensitive to the effects of the hormone. All of these will tend to lower the blood glucose. The resulting hypoglycemia may even be felt several hours afterwards when the carbohydrate stores in the liver and muscle are being replenished. Mike allows for this by taking a supply of dextrose tablets when he begins to feel low. I have to make sure that um, my, I've prepared myself for the exercise, um, compensated through either reducing the amount of insulin that I inject or by eating slightly more. And what about the effects of the evening pint? Alcoholic drinks will differ not only in the amount of glucose they contain, but also in the number of calories. So their effects on both weight and blood sugar levels must be considered. I try to keep um, to the spirits in general because they don't carry any carbohydrate. Although alcohol is not really too advisable for a diabetic to drink because of the way that it affects his metabolism. The problem is that it may actually reduce the blood sugar quite profoundly and therefore produce the condition of hypoglycemia. Uh, this is compounded by the fact that the symptoms of hypoglycemia and excess alcohol, i.e. drunkenness, may be remarkably similar. So if you're not careful, you end up in the wrong institution. In type 2 diabetes, alcohol is mainly a problem as far as the calories are concerned. Unfortunately, alcohol, nice for it is, is very calorific, and uh, it's quite easy to put down too many calories in a few drinks, and therefore, when people are trying to lose weight in order to treat their, their diabetes, uh, they do have to exercise uh, careful control of alcohol. So keeping blood sugar levels within strictly defined limits is a delicate physiological balancing act. It depends mainly on the ratio of the two pancreatic hormones, insulin and glucagon, 
which counteract each other's effects. What factors will affect this balance? Food is an obvious example. When we eat a meal, the blood glucose level rises. This triggers the release of insulin, which lowers the blood sugar and so restores the balance. On the other hand, exercise burns up sugar and tips the balance towards a state of lower blood glucose. This stimulates the release of glucagon, which acts in the opposite way to insulin. By promoting the conversion of glycogen and other storage compounds to glucose, it raises the blood sugar level, keeping it within normal limits. Finally, during periods of stress, the release of hormones such as adrenaline also lowers the ratio of insulin to glucagon. This mobilizes the body's glucose and fat stores and raises the blood sugar level. For people with diabetes, more insulin is needed during these periods to lower the high blood glucose levels. But approaches to treatment of diabetes would be easier if we knew the root causes behind the disease. In type 1 diabetes, there seems to be the need for an inherited predisposition, but this is fairly small compared with type 2 diabetes, which is very strongly inherited. And in type 1 diabetes, in those predisposed people, there seems to be another or several other factors, the first of which we believe is probably damage to the islet cells which produce insulin, probably by a virus or series of viruses. And this, is follow this sets in train a process whereby an antibody to the islet cells is produced. So this is an autoimmune disorder. And the antibody slowly destroys the remainder of the islet cells with subsequent development of complete insulin deficiency. In a normal pancreas, the B cells show up as brown clusters when stained for insulin. For someone with type 1 diabetes, up to 90% of the cells are destroyed by an infiltration of white blood cells, lymphocytes. By contrast, in type 2 diabetes, a degenerative process takes place in the pancreas, leading to the deposition of a fibrous protein. This amyloid, or starch-like protein, may interfere with the ability of B cells to detect glucose levels and secrete insulin. But in addition, and possibly as or more important, resistance to the actual production of insulin occurs. So that people are producing reasonable quantities of insulin, but it doesn't work properly. And this is largely related to the body mass and uh, fatness in the body. So that if people get overweight, this process is much more likely. Even in the absence of a more detailed knowledge of the causes of the disease, practical approaches to blood sugar regulation can be valuable. Jackie has been doing regular blood and urine tests to explore the best way of controlling her diabetes. Her readings can be used to trace out an average curve for her blood glucose levels over a 24-hour period. The main peaks in her blood glucose profile occur after breakfast and supper, which are her main meals. But the overall levels vary between 9 and 15 millimoles per litre, which fall within the range for high blood sugar or hyperglycemia. Now, when I'm looking at your blood glucose averaging tests... Which we Understanding the basis for these abnormal fluctuations may require specialist counselling. Diabetes day centres have recently been set up to allow for this. They are actually all a little bit on the high side. As long as you pay attention to the diet and watch that weight, uh, you might be OK. And you know what we have to look at. Adequate control of blood sugar levels is vital to prevent long-term complications. And this is important since more people with diabetes are surviving into old age when such complications may arise. Damage to the retina of the eye, retinopathy, is a common complaint. In fact, diabetes is the most common cause of blindness amongst people in the age group of 45 to 65. In a normal eye, the blood vessels that supply the retina are clearly visible. In a diabetic eye, the red patches are caused by hemorrhaging, leakage of blood. 
This is due to abnormal growth of new vessels, which may lead to detachment of the retina. In severe cases of retinopathy, white areas can be seen. These are due to the deposition of fatty material, which may affect the central part of the retina, leading to blindness. Any other problems, Jackie? Um, well, yes, Pam, I seem to have lost a bit of feeling um, part of my... Long-term diabetes oh, may also affect the peripheral nerves, particularly in the legs and feet. When people have had diabetes for quite a long time, particularly if they haven't been very well controlled, you can get a loss of sensation and an impaired blood supply to the feet. You want to look Reduced at sensation of the feet may result in corns, calluses, and in some cases, more dramatic results. Infection may set in, leading to foot ulcers. These may go unnoticed for years, simply because the impaired nerve supply to the legs prevents any sensation of pain. It's clear that diabetes is a lifetime responsibility, but now there's a greater awareness of the approaches that are most likely to solve its physiological challenges. There have been some very important changes. The first one pro probably was the introduction of the uh, blood testing which a patient could do themselves. And this was accompanied really by a change in philosophy uh, and a, a recognition that the person who's most important in all this is a person with diabetes and that they have to control their own diabetes and that we have to try and provide them with the instruments to help them do that and therefore it's not doctors and nurses who are controlling diabetes or making prescriptions which would help but for the person concerned to learn as much as they can about diabetes find out what affects their blood sugar and make the day-to-day -day adjustments whether it's in insulin dosage or what they eat or the exercise they take, which will achieve the sort of levels of control which are required uh, day in, day out, year in, year out, to prevent the late complications. Diabetes hasn't affected my lifestyle too much. It certainly changed my eating habits, but I really do now exactly as I was doing before. And I must say, I've just, I've got a bit more energy, in spite of my age. Being dependent on insulin is restricting in some ways. I feel that I can't always go off and do my own thing, like I couldn't be on a desert island for several weeks because I'm always reliant on um, insulin, which is manufactured, which is very unfortunate sometimes. But generally, it's just something that I've got to live with and um, you know, rule the diabetes rather than let the diabetes rule me. of the development.